I'm Bobby Wygant, and happy to be with you for this occasion. We're going to have a lot of fun today. I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I have a broadcasting degree from Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana, and my husband also was graduated from Purdue one semester ahead of me. He came to Fort Worth, Texas with a friend to help his friend drive the car back to Texas. And while he was there, he got a job at, of all places, WBAP Radio. Then we were married, and, and two days later, we were married on a Saturday, and two days later, I was in Fort Worth, Texas, brand new Texan. Then WBAP was going into television, and uh, my husband transitioned to the TV uh, set up because he had theatrical lighting experience. So he was made the lighting director. And one day he passed the manager in the hall who um, uh, wanted to know if Bobby wanted a job. Phil said yes. I ended up going to work two weeks before WBAP TV went on the air, uh, initially as a, a writer. But in those days, everybody was doing everything. And I found myself on the air doing TV programs, a kind of a, assisting Frank Mills and others who were hosting game shows, you know, whatever, to fill the time. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I, say, I like to say I was Vanna White before there was a Vanna White. In 1960, they started a a daytime program called Dateline, and I was, became the hostess of that program. And we did a little bit of everything. As I, I always said, if, if it isn't illegal or immoral, we'll do it. I was the producer of the show. Uh, any writing that had to be done, whatever had to be done concerning that show, I was doing it. But it, it was wonderful. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it the film companies started sending out stars to promote movies because they found that TV was really effective in selling movies. So uh, that's how I, I started building up this backlog of interviewing stars. My favorite celebrity interview was Bob Hope, but then I interviewed Bob so many times. He used to say, Bobby, you have enough stuff on me to do a 52-week series. But um, the first time I interviewed Bob, of course, I was very, very excited. Uh, I was a big Bob Hope fan from the word go. We were at the SMU Coliseum, and uh, we were sitting on the edge of the stage during one of the breaks, and uh, he was trying to get my name straight, and he was confused because Phil was there as promotion director, and, he, uh, and uh, I said, Bob, my last name is Wygant, that is my married name and my professional name. I said, nobody would choose Wygant for a professional name otherwise. And he said, that's all right, honey. He said, if I can make it with this nose, you can make it with that name. <laughs> Another person I enjoyed interviewing, I never knew what was going to happen, but that was okay. He was fun to talk with, was Bruce Willis. When he did the movie Armageddon, I was there in Los Angeles to interview him. And, uh, you know, these are quickie little interviews, four or five minutes. I started out by saying, uh, you have been in every paper magazine I pick up, uh, you and your three girls. And I said, uh, you know, playing the father role. And he said, I know, Bobby, I know. He said, it's not like the old days when you used to come up to the canyon and we used to dance naked all night. I go, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> he said, that was some other Bobby. <laughs> and he just carried it on, you know. So finally, the room producer was giving us the, you know, you're out of time. I said, okay. I said, Bruce, here you are. You've wasted all my time. And we haven't even talked about Armageddon. So he turns to the room producer and he says, turn, turn off the clock. I'll tell her when she leaves. <laughs> and he said, now, what do you want to ask me about the movie? So, okay, we do the movie. Now there's a lunch break. I go in to introduce 
uh, to interview the uh, director of the movie and uh, right after lunch, and we're getting ready and mic'd and everything. And just as we're starting, Bruce sneaks into the room, gets down by the, the director, and leans into his microphone. He says, do you know something? He said, Bobby used to come up to the canyon, and we used to dance naked all night. <laughs> One of my biggest events to cover was when the Beatles came to Dallas in 1964. Oh, so excited. But not just any press person could come. You were interviewed ahead of time, several weeks ahead of time, to get press credentials and uh, because space was, was somewhat limited. Anyway, the, I go the day of the uh, press conference, and uh, the, the manager comes out, and, and he gives us our instructions. You know, the Brits, everything is in order. Uh, so he said... Um, uh, when you want to ask a question, you'll raise your hand. Uh, when you're acknowledged, uh, then please stand and give your name and your affiliation. So about halfway through, I thought, I better get into this before they call it off. And I just raised my hand. I was acknowledged. I stood up, and I started to say my name. And in unison, the four lads said, Oh, we saw you on the telly today. And... <laughs> So that, that got us off to a good start. My question to them was, you guys uh, are a phenomenon in show business, but when you made your first big money, what did you indulge yourself with? And each one of them, it was an automobile. And uh, one was a Rolls Royce and, and uh, I don't know, uh, Lamborghinis, and they all kind of answered at one time. But, but it, it was an automobile, each one of them. That was their first big, a, a big uh, gift to themselves. So when the press conference was over, I wanted to go up to their manager and, and say to him, uh, thank you so much for... Uh, allowing me to participate in this. And um, so uh, he said, uh, well, you're staying for the show. And I said, uh, I, I don't have a ticket. And he said, well, then you'll just stay with me. So Brian Epstein and I stood at the foot of the stage all during that Beatle concert. And it was one of the big thrills of my life. I would have to say the most challenging thing in my whole career was November the 22nd, 1963. That was my 37th birthday. And I had a program that day, but they told me, they said, Bobby, uh, the, the, the motorcade is supposed to get to the Dallas Trademark, um, maybe during your program. If it happens during your time, between 12.30 and 1, we will cut immediately to uh, the, the trademark for President Kennedy. So I barely got into the program. I was interviewing Ray McKinley, the band leader, who was from Fort Worth originally and was in town that night to play at the uh, uh, Fort Worth Casino. And um, so I noticed my, my stage manager, uh, Ed Miller was doing all kinds of pressing the ear set uh, in, and, and I, I thought, what's the matter with Ed? And uh, then all of a sudden, he put his hands up like that, which is no standard signal for on-air people to know what. But at the same time, on the monitor, it said news bulletin, so I knew to stop talking. And the news bulletin was from Bob Welch, at, um, who was on the scene uh, photographing the parade that there, there was a, a, an incident during the parade and the motorcade sped off. And he said, sounds resembling shots were heard and we'll have more for you uh, as soon as we can get it. So anyway, that set off every little bit. They were breaking into my program and they would say to me, uh, Bobby, we're coming back to you. Pick up where you left off. So 
fortunately, Ray McKinley kept his wits about him. And in a situation like that, when you're the on-air person, you just do what they tell you to do, you know, pick up where you left off and go on, and that's what you do. So it was like that through Ray McKinley and through the second guest, and then we sent it up to the network. And by the the last uh, time I came on the air, before we went to the NBC network, I, they, uh, the announcement was that the last rites of the Catholic Church had been given to President Kennedy. And so then it came back to me. And I said, we mustn't read uh, too much into that. Anytime there is uh, uh, any kind of an unknown circumstance, uh, it's proper for Catholics. I'm Catholic. It, it's proper to receive the last rites of the Roman Catholic Church. So we signed off, went to the network, and at 107, it was officially proclaimed that President John F. Kennedy was dead. Some of my favorite legends, I have to mention Betty Davis and Olivia de Havilland. Um, I, I interviewed Betty Davis and Olivia de Havilland together when they came to Dallas, and uh, that was interesting because Betty Davis came in. It was a morning interview. <laughs> I took it she was not a morning person. And uh, she was very nicely attired. And um, But Olivia comes in, and uh, uh, she was, uh, you know, always very fond of French couture. And uh, I know I know it was a French designed outfit she had on. And she was so charming. She said, oh, we hear such nice things about you and that you're such a good interviewer. But the whole time she's looking at the camera set up at the other end of the room. And she says, if you'll excuse me a moment. And so Betty Davis and I sit down. And right away, Betty Davis whips out a cigarette and says, is there any coffee? <laughs> and Olivia's down at the other end working over the, the camera operator. And um, so I would look down that way occasionally, and there would be, uh, you know, moving this and moving that and, and uh, you know, bringing uh, lights down and so forth. And finally, you know, she completely reset the whole stage down there. So she comes back, she says, uh, Miss Davis, while well, you've been talking to our hostess here, she said, I've been working with the cameraman. And she said, uh, would you like to come and, and, and give your okay to everything? Betty Davis said, Livy, darling. She said, in all the years I've been doing this kind of thing, I always have the same makeup and same hair, and nothing hurts and nothing helps. And that was her answer. So we go down, we, we uh, get ready to sit down, and Olivia says, um, uh, Miss Davis, she said, um, you'll be on that side, and uh, Miss Wygant, you'll be on this side. It was a little settee-like thing, and, and she was in the middle. So, okay, now we do the interview. I go back to the studio, and when it it was on film, and when it came out of the lab, I took a look. We were all gathered around looking at it, and uh, as soon as the the three shot came up, I I just burst into laughing, and they're saying, why? why?" I'll tell you later. So I told them the story, because here we were, Betty Davis on one end, me on the other, Olivia in the middle, Betty Davis and I are looking like Godzilla, and but Olivia was younger than springtime beautiful. <laughs> then another time I interviewed Betty Davis, the legend, by herself, and it was a press conference ahead of me. We were set up by ourselves at the other end. So when the press conference was over uh, and she moved down to be with me, uh, a lot of the press photographers followed. And so Betty Davis sits down and she sees them and she says, one minute and then you all have to leave for the TV interview to continue. So uh, they, one guy had an especially long lens. You there with the long lens, no nostril shots.